Amen. Praise the Lord. Just before you see it, I want you to give a big shout of appreciation to the production team. Praise the Lord. All different backgrounds and cultures. Hallelujah. And uh, wasn't it great to see the African guy? Amen. When he saw the food. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. None of these are professional actors, but um, it's amazing that they are here serving God. Please take your seats. And I'm just going to go over a couple of things today because I really believe that this can be the best Christmas ever. How many of you want this to be the best Christmas ever? And I, I ask the question, why not? Why can't it be the best Christmas that we've ever had? You know, when, um, when I was a kid, Christmas was simple. It was, it was magical. You know, you just waited in anticipation for all of the presents to be unwrapped. Do you remember those days? It was so simple and it was so magical because you didn't have to pay for anything. And all the parents say, help me, Jesus. And as we grow, things start to get a little bit more complicated. But there's traditions, I remember, that were handed down from my parents. I remember going to my, my nana and my pops' house in the east end of London. And it was one of them old, you know, old London kind of terraced houses, big tall thing. And I remember we would go in there and it would, you know, there would be an old square television Remember those things? How many old people we got in the house? Pre-millennial, where the television was huge. Not just wide and flat, but thick and... Amen? And uh, we would watch all the old Christmas programs. You remember those? Even yesterday, I watched Oliver for like the 50th time. Amen? And I knew the words. How scary is that? Amen? And uh, I loved it. And there's more and more and more stuff that we do. And as we grow up, you know, you, you start to see Christmas change. It changes a little bit. You know, back in the day, it was simple. If we got some Lego or, you know, we got a pair of football boots, it was like amazing. But nowadays, it seems to be a little bit more complicated. But then, as a teen and an early adult, it started to lose some of its magic. It started becoming a little bit more stressful and disappointing. Amen. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you'd have to be... How many of you can remember being a teenager? Some of you are like, well, I'm not quite sure, man. But if you're a teenager now, you get what I'm saying. You have to go and be around different people and people that you don't necessarily want to hang out with. Family members and, you know, friends of family members and different people. And it started getting a bit weird. Some of the magic left. Some of the boredom crept in. Some loneliness crept in. I think it's really important that at this time of year we get a few things in place. We get a few things in our hearts and our minds that are set. I want to talk to you about two of these things today. I want to talk to you about two things, two reasons why Christmas is important and then two things that if you get them set in place then you can, you can have a really, really excellent Christmas. I looked into the background of Christmas, and um, for 28 years I've been studying this, and as I, I started to grow in my salvation, how many of you can remember when you first became a Christian and everything was like, you know, everything was different back then. You know, you get into stuff and you're very passionate about things, and I remember Christmas and hearing different stories about Christmas. And I used to get the ump with people that used to give you Xmas cards. How many of you have ever been into the place in your spiritual walk where you got tripped out by someone taking the Christ out Christmas? They've put Xmas, they've took, they've crossed out Christ. And I remember as a young Christian, I used to get the zig with that. But it's religious. It's people being religious that don't understand that X was actually the sign of Christians. <laughs> so whether they try and X Christmas out, they're putting Christmas in anyway. Jesus wins. But don't get religious about it. Then there's the tree, you know, is it, you know, is Thor going to appear? 
We're going to worship Thor. All that stuff, I remember as kind of a young Chris, Christian, struggling with all of this stuff. Was Jesus born on the 25th? And all of that. But studying into it, I've really, really come to understand the beauty of Christmas. Even more. There's two things, two ways that I see Christmas now. Number one, it's an opportunity to showcase how much love God has for this mad and selfish and rebellious world. That he would send his son to be born as a human. Most humans want to be something else, right? You get humans that want to be superheroes. You get humans that want to be their own God. And all of you, all of us, before Christianity, we all wanted to be our own God. You say, no, I didn't. And I say, oh, yes, you did. And you say, oh, come on, you ain't in the Christmas spirit yet. I'm trying to get you in the Christmas spirit. But we all wanted to be our own God because we all wanted to make our own decisions. And that's being your own God, to decide what's good and what's bad and what you can justify. And it's all subjective and it's all selfish and it's all you trying to be your own God. But nowadays, we can show the real God through what happens at Christmas. Christmas is something where uh, throughout the world, Christ is remembered. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is really cool. Christmas is all, also just a traditional festival, man, that can be enjoyed if it's done right and everything's in its right place. I mean, if you know, you can enjoy it. It's a festival. You're not going to go to hell because you celebrate Christmas or you have a tree in your house. You're not going to go to hell. Amen? It's not in the Bible. You will go to hell if you celebrate Christmas. The only way that people go to hell is by not believing in Jesus. It's not by what you do in that regard. It's about who you believe in, who holds your allegiance. If Jesus has your allegiance, how many people in this place believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? then that's what you need. Whether, you, whether you, you, you have a tree or you have gifts or you celebrate it on, a, on, on, on you know, the 25th, it's pretty irrelevant. Can I, can I kill a few sacred cows in the house right now? Biblically, it's irrelevant. Amen. What's important is do you believe in, trust in, and obey Jesus Christ and his word? That's important. And, but you can celebrate the traditional festival. It's a great time to get together. It's a great time to enjoy yourself. It's a great time. And whether we like it or not, from the beginning of history, 25th of December, in whatever calendar you want, Sumerian, Babylonian, Roman, Greek, whatever, that day is the midwinter point. It's a great time to have a festival. Everything's dark, everything's lonely, everything's miserable. You're halfway through, you're running out of food, no one knows what's going on. Have a festival. Traditionally, God allowed us to do that. And, and I don't know whether you're aware, but leading all the way up to Christmas, it's like you kind, of, you kind of drag your way into Christmas and then for a couple of days, everything just, you know, you don't even get dressed. Amen? Some of you on Christmas Day, you're going to stay in your gym jams. You are going to stay in an old tracksuit. Come on, somebody or at least sometime in the day, and you're just going to lounge, maybe Boxing Day, whatever. But then after that, it's almost like there's a new beginning that you can start to look forward to. We start gearing up for the new year, right? We start thinking, right, in the next year, it's going to be different to the last year. I'm going to be slim in the new year. I'm going to, I'm going to do this in the new year. I'm going to go to the gym in the new year. Come on, somebody. Woe to anyone that buys someone a gym membership for Christmas. <laughs> Amen. You can't even recycle it. So two important things. But check this out. I want, us to, I want us to look at these two things that I think are really important for us at Christmas. People and places. People and places. And there's, there's, there's this understanding of Christmas that I want you to get. I'm going to be real quick. The key to this whole nativity story is that it's a reality. It might just be, though, that the timing of it is a little bit different than we think or that we see on the Christmas cards or in some of the movies. 
because we kind of all think that it happens all at once. But in actual fact, biblically, this whole nativity story took place over about 18 months. It took about 18 months. Probably more from the time, you know, obviously nine months before that, when, from the time that Joseph was told in a dream that he had to listen to his wife who said that she got pregnant without him and it was God that, that did it. I mean, I don't know about you, but Joseph had to have had the most faith in, in, in his future wife than anyone I've ever heard of. Amen. Someone once said, you know, the nativity story is about a young woman who's unmarried, who gives birth to a child with an unknown father outside in the dark on her own. He said that could be any Tuesday in Manchester. <laughs> but what makes the nativity story different? We can, we can calculate the birth of Christ from the, from the Bible. You can calculate it from Revelation chapter 12 when there's astronomical signs. And people that are cleverer than me, they've put them astronomical signs from Revelation chapter 12 into a computer, an astronomic, not astrological. This is not about your star sign. This is about the planetary alignments. They've put it into a computer and calculated Jesus' birth to September the 11th, 3 B.C., so they've done that. So he was born in September. So what's the Christmas thing all about? Well, the Christmas thing is about the whole journey of this going forward. But where do people and places come into it? First of all, the place is really important where he was born. We know that he was born in Bethlehem. But is that important? What about the manger? Is that important? This place was supremely important. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. There's a decree from the Roman emperor, Augustus, that a census is taken. And everyone returned to their ancestral towns. Joseph was a descendant of King David. He had to go to Bethlehem in Judea. And uh, he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. Then the Bible says this in verse 6. While they were there, the time came for a baby to be born. Now this is important. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth. Some places it says swaddling cloths, right? And then she laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available. We see, and we even see it, sorry, in our play where they're going around banging on the doors of inns. You know, they're looking for a place. No one will let them in. And straight away, immediately, we go, boo! You know, and it plays into a, a lovely Christian narrative of, you know, Jesus was born in a place that no one wanted him. And it was, you know, he was born into, into to squalor and poverty in an old stable at the back of someone's house. No one would let him in. And all oh, woe is us. Boo, there's people in the world today that won't let Jesus into their lives. Even when he's knocking on the door, they won't let him in. But in actual fact, technically, Jesus and Mary would have known where, they, where it was they were going. And there was one place that it was prophesied that the Messiah needed to be born. Watch this, Micah chapter 4, verse 8. 700 years before the birth of Jesus. He says, And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion. In Hebrew, it says, O you, Migdal Ada. Migdal Ada. Everyone say that. Migdal Ada. Migdal Ada. Say it, Migdoeda. I want it to lock in your brain. It was really important, this. It says, that's the place. To you it shall come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. And then another chapter over in 5 verse 2, it says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Now check this out. This is going to blow your mind. When Mary and Joseph were going to give birth to this, this, this miracle child in Bethlehem where it was prophesied that the Messiah was going to be born, they wouldn't have just gone to some random stable. In fact, technically, the wording in the New Testament doesn't give us the word for, you know, an old, an old stable thing. It actually gives us the words for where Jesus was going to go 
and it was a specific place, and it was the Migdoeda. He would, he, they went there, right, to this place called the Migdoeda, the Watchtower of the Flocks. Now check this out, it's going to blow you away if you've never heard this before. The Watchtower of the Flock was a place just outside Bethlehem where lambs were born. But they weren't just normal lambs. It wasn't just like the sort of lamb you put in your curry. Hallelujah. Amen. Wasn't the sort of lamb you have for Sunday dinner. These were lambs that were birthed from the Levitical herds or flocks of sheep. And what does that mean? Why is that important? Well, these flocks of sheep were the ones that were tended in Bethlehem and only Bethlehem in the surrounding areas by Levitical shepherds. What are Levitical shepherds? Levitical shepherds are people that were trained as Levites, by Levites. You know, Levites were the ones that, that did all the service in the temple, right? They were trained to raise these sheep to give birth to lambs in the Migdoeda. And these lambs would be the only lambs that could be used as sacrifices in the temple at Passover. Now check this out. So Mary and Joseph turn up in Bethlehem. It's full. Everyone's there. Where are they going to go? They're not just going to go in some old dirty stable. They knew where it was that they needed to go. And they would have gone. They wouldn't have had it in someone's house, the house of one of their friends and family, because a woman with an issue, an issue of blood would have, would have made the place unclean. They knew they weren't going to do that. So they went to the Migdoeda. The Migdoeda would have been ceremonially clean. They would have took care of it, these shepherds. And into it they came, and in there there would have been these mangers in the, in, in, in the place. You go in there, and there would have been these things called mangers. The mangers were the places where when the ewe gave birth to the lamb, the shepherds would get it, and they would put it in the manger. And then what they would have is these cloths. And they would swaddle the lamb in cloths, clean it, and then what they would do is they would examine it. Why? Because it had to be without spot or blemish. It couldn't have a crooked leg or a wonky nose or a bent ear old, right? It had to be without spot or blemish. Why? Because if it was without spot or blemish, then they would take it from that place and they would put it in a different flock. That flock was earmarked to become, a, to become the sacrifices at the temple, at Passover, for the sins of the nation. It was that place that Mary and Joseph went. It was that place that they gave birth to this son, this child, Emmanuel. It was in that place that they took him and they covered him in these swaddling cloths. It was in that place. It had to be that place. Because if he wasn't born in that place, he wouldn't have qualified to become the Messiah from his birth. But because he was born there, not in some random stable, not in some house out the back, not in some little cave somewhere else, but in the watchtower of the flock, the Migdol Adar that was prophesied by the prophet Micah, because he was born in that place, he was qualified from his birth. But how then do we know that he was qualified? Well, he qualified in the right place, but then they needed the right people. Now check this out. We see then the first people to see him. We know in the story, right, that there were angels that came down to the shepherds. The shepherds were washing their socks by night, amen, all seated around the tub. That's what the other song goes, right? While shepherds wash their socks by night, all seated around the tub. No? The angel of the Lord came down and they began to scrub. No? That's not, the, that's not the one that you learned growing up. But they were out in the fields. They had to be out in the fields. Why? Because the sheep had to be out there for 365 days so that they could get out in the open. 365 days, I'm giving you technicalities. 
so that they could then give birth to the lambs that would be ceremonially clean that could be used later on to be sacrifices in a temple. So they were outside and then the angels appeared to the shepherds. Why didn't they appear to the priests? Why didn't they appear to, to Herod? Why didn't they appear to the, the Sadducees or the Sanhedrin? Ask me why. Because these people were the right people. We see it in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 20, and it says, this is, this is what they said. They were terrified. If you ever see an angel, it's going to scare the life out of you. The angel said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And then watch this. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Notice he didn't tell them where to go. He just told them what to look for. Why didn't he give them directions? Oh, it's at number 13, Jericho Street. Right? Because they would have known. These were the, these were the experts in this. And once, he, once the angel told them the sign to look for, immediately they knew where that stuff happened. Right? You're going to go there shepherds, and you're going to find a special lamb. And he's going to be wrapped up just like the other lambs. And he's going to be laying in the manger just like the other lambs. You know where it is you need to be going because you're the experts in this. And then the angel said, Suddenly, the angel was joined by a great vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. This was an amazing event. When the angels had returned to heaven, the, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village. They found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what happened and what the, the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. It was just as the angel told them. The place was important because that qualified him to be the Messiah. But the people were important because these were the experts in examination of the lambs and what happened was they knew where it was that they needed to go and when they got there it was just as they'd been told and it, all of a sudden imagine it must have just gone just blown their minds that all of the things that they'd have been doing figuratively now literally the sacrifice the messiah was right here in front of their eyes and it says they went away they told everyone they worshiped so what does that mean that means that they agreed with it that means that they'd examined him. That means that they'd looked at him and they'd said, you know what? This is true. This is it. Because unless he had been examined to be without spot or blemish, he wouldn't have been qualified to become the sacrifice, sacrificial lamb. So can you see how people and places play a massive part in this story? And when you actually scratch the surface of the Bible, you scratch the surface of the narrative, you actually see the amazing, intricate, detailed, perfect plan of God unfold. There's no coincidence in this. There's no one can tell you that this Christmas stuff is a load of nonsense because all of the, 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 the different elements all come together and needed to be in the right order, in the right place, so that we can now have a saviour that we can trust in, who is who he says he is, who did what he said he would do, so that we can be saved and we can go to heaven and we can have our lives changed and transformed. Here's the thing, unless you're in the right place, you're never going to be established in what God wants for your life. And unless you're around the right people who are friends who will tell you you've got something in your teeth, unless you're examined, you can never be qualified. So all of this played out in this story, and it's beautiful. Christmas is amazing. Next week, I'm going to tell you why the 25th is important. So you have to come back for that. 
Hallelujah. But today, I just want to finish off with this. What does that mean for us today? You know, I love talking about this technical stuff because the amount of people that don't understand this, they don't know this. They don't realize the richness of God's Word. They don't understand the richness of Scripture. They don't understand how real this stuff is. And you can talk about all of it. There is evidence for every single element of Jesus' life. You know, I, I'm not a Christian just because I was a drug addict and he set me free. I'm a Christian because I've examined the evidence and my faith is in the facts that Jesus is who he says he is. That creation is how it says it is. Are you with me? Scientifically, it's all there. Everything in the, in the universe is created from sound and light. We live in a world of time, space, and matter. In the beginning, time. Amen. God created the heaven, space, and the earth, matter. God said, let there be light. Light. Sound. Everything is there. There's evidence for all of this stuff. And when you get that, man, then you're on good foundation. Doesn't matter what happens to you. You know that Christianity is the only way. Jesus is the only way. But let me, let, me, let, me, let me change gear a little notch. What about God's plan for us today? How can we have a great Christmas? Because I believe that his plan for us is perfect. Just as his plan was perfect then, right? That the right people in the right places can be in your life. But you've got to work it out. You've got to be intentional. God was intentional. There's nothing accidental in the story of Jesus Christ. There's nothing accidental in the narrative. There's nothing accidental in the journey. It's all intentional. But sometimes we live accidentally. Some of you are accidentally going to be in the wrong places, surrounded by the wrong people this Christmas. But you don't have to be. Because there are places and there are people that you can be intentional about that are going to bless your life. You don't have to just, you don't have to be around people that are like energy vampires. You don't have to be around people that are going to suck the joy out of your life. Come on, somebody. You can, you can go in and you can blow in, you can blow up and you can blow out. Be intentional about it. You don't have to stay in a place where you're not tolerated. Hallelujah. You have to go to places where you're celebrated. So there are different places. There is a place for you that is perfect, filled with special people. And this idea of place is multidimensional. You know, there's, there's a place in your mind that you need to have. I mean, if you know, Christmas is not a date. Christmas is a feeling. It's an, it's, it's an intention. It's a desire. It's a want to, to, to be around the things that God is around, that God is a giving God. He gave us stuff. You want to give, you know, you want to give goodness to people. Not be like Scrooge or the Grinch. The ultimate place to be is in God's presence. Sometimes we forget about that. Sometimes, how many of you take God's presence for granted? How many of you take God's presence for granted? Let me see your hands. Sometimes we don't, we don't get in his presence enough, but his presence is available to us. We can enter into his presence through the blood of the Lamb because of who Jesus is and what he's done. You just have to be intentional about it. The ultimate place is in his presence and the center of his will. Being part of the Bible, believing and practicing church is a good start. Some people are going to dispense with church. Amen. But church is God's idea. It's a place where his presence fills everything. But some people don't want to do church. Amen. And so therefore, accidentally, you're going to be around unchurched people. And then wondering why things are difficult, things are hard, your mind's all messed up, your life's not going the way you want it to go. Because of the place. Because unless you're in the right place, you don't qualify to get the, the things that it is. Just like Jesus. Engaging with a community of transformed and transforming people is spiritually essential to life. I mean, if you know, you become like the people that you're around. If you're around people in the flesh, guess what? They're always in the flesh. Amen? It's like, it's like hanging around with the pigs in the pig field, the Bible says. You get dirty. They love it. You feel dirty. 
They feel normal. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I get around some people that are not saved, like some, some old friends and some old people from back in the day and back in the world, and they're effing and blinding and cussing and moaning and whining and groaning and miserable. And I'm like, I'm feeling uncomfortable with this. Back in the day, I would have been a pig rolling around in the field with them. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. It, it blows me away that Christians that can roll around like pigs and not worry about it. Because then I wonder if, if they've ever changed. Come on, somebody. Huh? But you don't know unless you're around people that are not. And sometimes that's why people don't want to get around people in churches. They want to stay away from churches because they like getting dirty. Huh? Someone say a wink. <laughs> but the right places are important. The right people are important. Getting in the right place. This Christmas, be in the right place. Just come to church. Amen. Christmas Eve, come to church. Go to church. Amen. Be in the right place. Then Christmas Day, you're going to be freshened up. You're going to be armored up. You're going to be in the right place. You're going to be surrounded by God's presence. So then when you meet them un unsaved uncles and aunties, they're always moaning about you. Oh, you've got fat. You look old. Oh, you've grown old since the last time I saw you. You know the ones. There's always the ones that turn up and start to put the, put the Grinch on things. Huh? Still single. When are you getting married? What do you do for a living? Come on now, you're going to get this this Christmas. I'm helping, I'm helping you out to see the truth. But intentionally, if you've been in the right place, there's a different mindset. There's a different armor that you've got on. There's a different place that you are in your own mind, in your own thinking, in your own heart, in your own identity. I don't belong in the pig field. So it's that place that establishes you. But then getting around the right people, it's those people that examine you to see whether or not you qualify. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. When you get around good people, when you get around the right people, when you get around spiritual people, I had someone call me the other day and they said, oh, I'm really sorry, you know, we're not with you anymore and when I was with you, I thought you were too radical, but now I just understand being in the place I'm at that you were just biblical. So how many of you know, for some people that choose intentionally to roll around in the pig field, biblical people are radical. Come on now. But how many of you know, it's just being biblical. It's just doing the things that God expects us to do. To love him and love other people. To worship him, not ourselves and not other stuff. To be around community of believers. To enjoy his presence. All of that stuff. But you've got to understand that when you're around spiritual people, they sharpen you, they quicken you. You know, whenever I come to church, I get around people and I'm like, sometimes I'm counseling people and I'm getting rebuked. Just by their lifestyle, by the things that they're doing, the things that they're saying. This, this last couple of weeks, I was visiting people that were sick, people with cancer, people that are starting treatment, people that are getting involved in, 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 in horrible situations. And I was around them, and instead of them just moaning and groaning, I mean, I was moaning and groaning on my way there. I got in a car, my back was hurting, my eyes were hurting. I was tired, I had to drive to another place. Come on now. I mean, if you do that. Got to drive again, the price, the price of petrol, uh, 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 people on the road, lunatic, you know. Someone's cutting you up, someone going too slow. Come on, come on. Loving yourself up, useless driver. We all do it. Can you help me out and be honest and say amen? We, 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 we get angry, we do that stuff, even as Christians. I'd prayed in the morning, I'd studied the Word of God, I'd praised my God, everything was good in the hood, and then I got in the car and some idiot in front, fruit killers, you know what I mean, fruit snufflers, fruit thieves, <laughs> right? 
But then I got to these people and I'm like talking to them. And they're like, yeah, you know, it's, it's okay. I believe God's with me. You know, I've just got to do it. I'm going to get on with it. It's going to be all right. Straight away, I'm getting rebuked. Because I'm around people that have a different perspective. That is spiritual. And it doesn't matter how long you've been in this journey of Christianity, you can get around someone that can help you, can examine you, can help you to know that you qualify. You can go back and you can repent. Or, uh, coming back on the, in the car on the way back, I'm going, oh, God, forgive me. <laughs> how many of you have ever done that? Help me out. Right? You get around someone, you're, you're there, you're at uni, you go out for a little party, you have a little drink up with your friends, come on somebody, you have a little bit too much, you come to church, huh? instead of there's no high like the most high, you've gone for the other high, and then when the high goes, it's low, And you start feeling away. But how many of you know, when you're in the right place, surrounded by the right people, they lift you. They examine you. You start thinking about things differently. It's okay. So this Christmas, it's really important that we're going to be in the right places with the right people. What are the right places? The right places are the places where you're celebrated. Remember that. Amen. Where you're celebrated. There are some people that are not part of you anymore. There are some people that are negative to you now. There are some people that just haven't got your best interests at heart. There are some people that were there for a season, for a reason, but now the season's changed. It's cool. Let them go. A tree, when have you ever seen a tree in autumn trying to pick a leaf up and stick it back on the branch? Once the leaf's fallen off the branch, the leaf's gone, man. It's going to go into the soil. It's going to do good elsewhere. But you can't put it back on a branch. It's, it's gone. It's time to go. It's gone. There are some people like that. There are people that become toxic to us, like poison. Amen. Or like too much sugar or, you know, anything. Sometimes you've got to make a decision that I'd rather be where I'm celebrated than be where I'm not tolerated. The older I've got, the less sentimental I become. Because the more I realize that I've sacrificed stuff that was rejected. And now, I want to go with people that accept it. Be that. Amen. Go to the right place. Get around the right people. Yeah, you're going to have people that come around your house because you made a mistake and invited them. Hallelujah. When you was, you were having a good day in September. Hallelujah. You felt really generous. You know, it was a good day. You felt skinny. You looked in the mirror. It was nice. You had a good hair day. You were feeling benevolent. Come on, somebody. And you invited someone around for Christmas, and now you're like, oh, God. There's going to be that. Hallelujah. So you be the right person. Amen? You be the right person. If you put the right people in the right places together, you're going to have a tremendous, tremendous year. And if you're in the wrong place with the wrong people, don't stay there. Winston Churchill once said, if you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> don't stay there, man. Visit. Say hi. And then say bye. But whatever you do this Christmas, understand the reality of this season. That Jesus Christ is who he says he is. He did what he said he was going to do. He qualified. He's real. Christmas is not just some myth. It's not some stuff that we can't have anything to do with. Enjoy it for what it is. But understand that the story behind it about the facts of the birth of Jesus Christ hold water there of evidence they fulfill prophecy of hundreds of years. There's too much coincidence for it to be a coincidence. And then this year, enjoy it. Amen? Take a day and eat and celebrate. Have a feast. You know one thing that God loves about the Jews is their celebrations. They celebrate. They knew how to have feasts. They had seven feasts throughout the year where they would eat and drink and, you know, they would have a good time. I'm not saying that you should... Drink too much, hallelujah, if at all. But I'm saying have a good time. Have a good time. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Whew. That was good. That was, listen, that, that was good stuff, man. That was good stuff. That was Bible stuff. That was theological stuff. There was a little seasoning in there of humor. Hallelujah. There was a few pigs involved. I mean, if you know, we're going to have pigs in blankets this year. Glory to God. So as I said last week, forget the beef. This year's about turkey. Amen. And by that, I mean, don't have beef with people. But you can eat beef. You can have lamb. You can have rice. You can have a pound of yam. Come on, somebody. You can have whatever it is that you want this year. It's, a, it's irrelevant. I'm a white guy. We have turkey and potatoes. And we have parsnips and carrots and Brussels sprouts. And the best way to do Brussels sprouts is a little bit of salt and pepper, a little tiny bit of honey. Stick them in a slow cooker till they're crispy. It's the way forward. Stick them in a bowl with some chopped walnuts, a little bit of beetroot. You know what I mean? Some stuff like that. Maybe a little bit of apple. I'm just giving you that for free. Hallelujah. Amen. Make sure you season that turkey. Amen. Not like a white person either. White people season their turkey when it's on the plate. Amen. We get it backwards. But thank God we're in a multicultural church because we've learned. We've learned how to season our meat. Eat some pudding. Hallelujah. You know, you can have brandy butter because it doesn't actually have alcohol in it. It's just flavoring. Amen. It's okay. It's not going to take you to hell. And if you haven't been able to spend extravagantly on gifts, it's okay. The most valuable thing you can give to someone is your time. They might not think it's that valuable when you turn up uninvited, but you can let them know, listen, I'm a gift. Hallelujah. I'm going to be the best gift that you've had this year. But I don't know about you, but we need to enjoy this time of year. Stop being miserable with it. Don't be scroogey. Jesus Christ came to give us life. Give us life in abundance. Give us life to the full. Give us life that we can enjoy it. In the, he's given us the right places. He's given us the right people. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Come on, let's stand to our feet. You can quote me to people this Christmas. Someone says, why are you leaving so early? You can say, pastor told me. It was in a message, I got a word. <laughs> they might not understand what you're talking about, but where you will. Come on, just close your eyes a minute. Just think about Christmas is starting. The season is beginning. Settle yourself. Settle your heart. Don't be stressed. Don't rush it. Enjoy your life. Too many people try and rush through seasons of their lives and then they get old and they wish that they'd have waited a little bit longer and enjoyed it a little bit and gone a bit slower. Make that decision right now that you're going to enjoy yourself. It's not a sin to have joy. When it's centered in God, it gives you strength. Lift up your hands. Just begin to worship. Emmanuel. King of Kings, God the Son, the one who upholds all things. He 
had to be born as a human so that he could pay for the sins of humanity. And he was born in the place that the Bible said so he would qualify. Examined by the people that he was examined by so that he would qualify to become you and I's saviour. Take a moment, just, just love on him a little bit. These are my favorite moments in a church service, other than worshiping the Lord at the beginning. I love God's word and I preach, but I know it's not the most important part. The most important part is connecting with Him. Whether that comes in worship, whether that comes someplace in the word, or even at this moment in the response, that's the most important part. Because the most important thing in our lives most important thing in any season is the reality of Jesus Christ. He's the most important person that you will ever, ever meet. Some of you right now, you need to give your hearts and lives to Him. Simple to do. Not easy. Many people struggle with it throughout the world because there's something of you that you have to put down. of you this year is the year to come back to him fully to consecrate your life to his service to come and live with him to let him lead you and guide you fully to covenant once more with him and with others with your church with your people to agree together that what you're going to do you're going to follow him in this coming year because there's power in that agreement. It's okay, there's going to be hustle and bustle, but just take a moment. Connect with the living God. Emmanuel. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Champion. Saviour. decision that this year you're going to covenant with God that you're going to follow him fully if that's you and you say yeah I want that this year forget in the past what's ever gone beyond before you know that God is real that Jesus is real that this story is real that the power of God is real that transformation is real that salvation is real you can't do it on your own. If you say, you know what, this year I'm consecrating, this coming year I'm consecrating my life to Jesus. Just lift up your hands. All over this place. I'm consecrating my life to Jesus. Lift up your hands. I'm consec- whether, you, whether, whether you've done it before or not, whether you're in it or not, you're saying, I'm making a, a decision right now. I'm consecrating my life to Jesus. Lift up your hands. Lift them high. Lift them up consecrating my life to Jesus. It's important. If you lifted up your hands, come out to the front. We're going to pray together. We're going to worship together. Come out. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Come out. You're not joining the church. You're consecrating your life to Jesus. Come out.
Guys, come out. Fill this place up. Come out. Press right in. Press in. You're making a decision. And what that's going to do is that's going to enable you to be in the right places and you're going to get around the right people. God's going to enable that through His grace and by His power. Because when you make that decision, you turn to Him. I'm consecrating my life to you. All of a sudden, a new direction opens up. There is a simplicity in it. God empowers it and He enables it. It all starts with a decision.